everyone and welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Lou and I am from the Environment Centre NT and today we um, are joined by some lovely hosts to share their knowledge on the changing of the seasons. Um, so today we'll have David Little who is an ecologist and Ian who is a spokesperson for nature. Um, Greg is a former Kakadu National Park Chief, Ranger and Wildlife Conservationist and author. And we've got um, George Burns and um, Neville has been pre-recorded by video. And um, Lou, I'll just, uh, Lou, George Burns is a uh, clinical psychologist and author. Clinical psychologist and author. Great, thanks, Andy. Thank um, and yes, yeah, so today we'll be looking at um, the dry season, habitats, plants and fire and looking to connect more with nature and tune into these changes as they're happening in our environment. And just want to, yeah, welcome to this webinar series, which we've been doing a few of these and we have a few more scheduled throughout the rest of the year, um, just to make sure everyone is connected and still learning um, in this environment. So uh, yeah, look, thanks Lou for that in introduction. So. I mean, it's pretty obvious the dry season's here. You know, we've got the smell of smoke in our, in our nostrils. Um, the sun sort of sets as a red globe on many evenings and, um, and I guess many mornings I get up and put a jumper on. So that's certainly, to me, in, in my face, indicators that the, that the dry is here. But I'm actually really excited to be here today with um, these other people who've got a huge amount of knowledge about the dry season, and particularly um, Ian and Greg have got a very astute observers of natural history and have been in the top end for, for decades. And I'm really looking forward to hearing them talk a little bit about some of their impressions of the dry and reflections on the dry, because there's a whole lot of stuff that it's pretty easy to simply walk past and, and ignore. Um, but if you're alert to it, then yeah, you can, you can key into what's, what's going, going on. We've got, this sort of pretty simplistic terminology, but we tend to talk about the wet season and the dry season. Um, but if you actually engage with Aboriginal people and, and read a bit about Aboriginal views of the, of the wet and or the seasonal changes in the, in the top end, then actually there's often six or seven seasons um, recognised and each has their own characteristics and, and names. And, um, and, and I guess partly what that's reflecting is that the, the actual seasonal change throughout the year, it, well, it, it's just nature's very complex and there's this constant on, ongoing change. Some of those changes are, are fairly gradual. Some of those changes are actually, actually quite, quite sudden. Um, we're very fortunate that we uh, Neville Namanyuk is, um, well, just on Friday, it was a, he made a video um, telling us about some of the seasons as, as he, he views it. So he's a, a West Arnhem Land man. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing his, or his view of the, the seasonal changes as well. And it's very much a, a current view given this was recorded on, on Friday. There's a whole lot of really good resources around about Aboriginal um, knowledge of, of seasons and, and plants. And Ian, if you are able to share screen, could you, uh, start off with that slide of the uh, Glenn Whiteman books, please. Be much appreciated. Right, I'll do my best here. <laughs> so while while Ian's getting getting that up, um, a part of that knowledge of um, of the the seasons, well, that's re that's readily available. Is an example is to see the work that well the books have been authored by many Aboriginal people in association with Ben Whiteman from the NT Baron. Thanks, Ian, that's great. Um, and here's just a, a small selection of those books. I mean, there's stacks of them, but there's, there's all sorts of information um, about plants and animals and a whole lot of information in there about seasonal indicators as, as well. So there's a fair, fantastic uh, resource there. Um, Ian, perhaps if we could jump to the next slide, which is a, a seasonal calendar one, I think. Look, there's also, um, right, so here's one representation of a, of a seasonal calendar. There's also some fantastic seasonal calendars that have been produced by CSIRO with um, various Aboriginal groups. So there's, there's certainly one for the Larrakia area, which is where I am today. 
um, in, the, in Darwin itself. Um, but there's lots of other indigenous groups in the top end who have produced these seasonal calendars of CSIRO. And you can do a search on the internet, on the, you know, CSIRO, seasonal calendar, top end, whatever, something along those sort of lines will, will provide access. And you can just download those, those calendars. And there's a, there's a, a wealth of information there um, about, about those. Um, and uh, yeah, there's lots of other, lots of other resources as, as well, once you start looking into it. Well, what I'd actually, and I mean, obviously I'm talking about the resources because I think they're great and I really enjoy looking at them and learn, learn a lot from them. What I'd really encourage people to do is actually open your ears, use your sense of smell, um, sort of sense yourself what's actually, what's actually happening. And that's, and I mean, if you're living out bush, that's, that's pretty easy because it's, a lot of this is, is sort of in, in your face. But even if you're in town, I mean, one of the real joys to me of Darwin is the amount of wildlife that we've got, the, the, the abundance of, of native plants and, and animals. And, and so whether you're, well, like I'm at the moment sitting on my balcony, which is a wonderful spot, I really enjoy this and um, see lots of things happening. Um, or whether you're driving to work or going somewhere to play or whatever. Um, yeah, just sort of you know, take note of what plants are in flower. Take, take note of the raucous red tailed black cockatoos flying over, over overhead and, and just sort of sense those things because yeah, we're just lucky to, to, to live in such an environment where there's, there's so much change throughout the year. Um, so I guess at this stage, I'm still sort of talking about some fairly coarse things that are happening or whatever. And, and fire is obviously something that's in our face at, at this time of the year. And I'd encourage people to think, think of a bit more about the implications of fire. But before I say more about fire, I'm, I'm gonna pause for a few seconds in a, in a shortly. And what I'd ask people to do is actually just close your eyes and imagine the smell of grass smoke and just see what that Trigger, triggers in your in your in your head. So all right, so let's just, let's just pause for just a few seconds. I'm going to close my eyes and pause for a bit. All right. So grass smoke. Well, that triggers a whole lot of thoughts to, to me. But one one of them is that what status the sorghum's at. So we've, we've had the knock them down winds have happened, the sorghum's dried off, it's fallen over, the grass is pretty much, oh, sorry, the seeds are pretty much all, all fallen off at the moment. And one of the images that, that I conjure up of that seed is that the, the seeds of sorghum have a really long tail or awn on them, which is sensitive to changes in humidity. And so the difference between overnight and during the day and those changes in humidity, that, that long tail or awn actually twists and turns, and what that does is that it actually burrow the, the seeds burrow into the ground, um, which is fantastic because that's somewhere where then the seeds can be um, insulated by the soil and, and out of the way of, of of the fires when they come through. But of course, not all the seed makes it into the ground, and and I, from Ian, we're going to hear more today about just how important things like sorghum seed are for for some of the grain eating, the granivorous birds, the seed eating birds that we've we've got in got in the top end. And that and that's yeah a really interesting interesting um, story, but the um, yeah the, the the sort of it also makes me think about the role of fire in our landscape. And I mean we live the dominant landscape we've got in the top end is actually savanna country, which is this mix of grasses and trees, grasses grasses and woody plants, and the the fire is actually really important for keeping the woody plants in check, um, and you know keeping it open so that um, keep keeping that the vegetation more open, so that then the, the grasses can can flourish. So fire's actually got a really important role to play in maintaining our landscapes in the in the top end. But of course, fire can get out of kilter, um, and if we see too frequent fire and too hot a fire, well, then there's a whole lot of things that that don't su survive. And of course, one of the one of the issues that we're facing in the the top end at the moment is the is the invasion of gamba grass and the um, which ups the fuel load really significantly, um, resulting in, in much hotter fires. And the reason why um, I'm talking about gamba grass here is that there's a lot of work going on at the moment to actually write a, a new gamba grass um, management plan. So Ian, if we could jump to the next slide, please. Um, 
So this is um, this is this is a, the current Gamba grass management plan. So this is adopted under anti-legislation, and there's a process in train at the moment to write another one. It'll be a 10-year plan from 2020 to 2030, and that's going to guide what happens with with Gamba grass um, management over the over the next next decade. And I anticipate that'll go out for public comment within the next couple of months. And I'd really encourage people to actually engage with that and um, put in your two bobs worth. You know, think think about well, what do you want to see happen in Litchfield National Park? Um, you know, we've got these high biodiversity values areas around the place, um, and and where do we see the future of those? So when this goes out for public comment in the next couple of months, then um, you have a real opportunity to actually have your say about where where you want to see these top end landscapes, the direction you want to see them. Them, them head. And we also saw Friday, well, Friday before last, um, the NT government um, released its, its a paper about the um, rebound from COVID-19 and talked about a, a Gamber army. And that's, again, something that's really worth, worth getting, getting behind. And I'm, sort of, I'm hoping that in late June, we'll actually have a, a webinar that will actually focus on Gamber okay. grass because it's such an important <laughs> All right, so I guess, yeah, fire is obvious in the obvious in the, in, the, in the dry, but what are some of the more subtle signs that are, that are going on? And sitting here in, on my, my balcony, um, then yeah, I've been absolutely delighted in the, in the last um, few weeks. We've had some grevilleas come out in flower. So Ian, perhaps we could jump to the next, um, the next slide, please. Okay, so this is the, um, this, this, this is the view of, uh, well, just to my left, this is looking, look, looking off our balcony. And, uh, you probably see on the, the left-hand side of centre there, there's a, a bit of red tinge in the, in the top of a, tr a tree there. And that's, a, that's one of the local grevilleas, top-end grevilleas, that's burst into flower. And with that, it's just been amazing. I can sit here and have lunch, and I'll have four different species of honey eaters will be flitting around frenetically collecting nectar in that, in that tree. And I think, I mean, they're all, I guess they're all high on a sugar fix. Um, as they, and they just seem to be so much... Full, full of energy, so you know, dusky honey eaters, white throated honey eaters, are, are just going, going, feeding frenetically, and then a um, a white gate honey eater. So Ian, if we could jump to the next slide, please. The white gate honey eaters are a little bit bigger than the um, than those other ones that I was talking about, and and one of those will arrive on the scene and chase the other uh, other birds away. But then five minutes later, the others are back anyway, um, and even occasionally we we have um, things even a bigger bigger still. We've got the um, a white quilled honey eater, which most people would know of as a, as a blue faced honey eater. That's a former name of it for the top end uh, species of that. And, um, and they're even bigger, bigger and burlier and bossier than the, the white gapes. So they'll even chase the white, white gapes away. So it's just fantastic. As we had the dry season arrive, then as I sit here having my lunch, I can just see these different things happening in, in front, of, front of my, my eyes. And I'm, and I'm sure, you know, wherever you are, if you look around, you'll actually have these things happening, um, which, which are just, just, just great. Uh, one of the, the, and then looking a bit past the, the grevilleas and where my view extends to actually is a, a whole lot of uh, stringy barks and woolly barks. And um, at this stage, they haven't started, started flowering, but with the, the advent of the cold weather, it won't be long and they, they will, be, will be flowering. So we we'll have the cream flowers on the on the stringy barks, and the brilliant orange flowers of the of the woolly barks. Actually, my sense this year is that they actually might be a little almost, if you want to talk about shed, a little bit behind shed. So they're a little bit late com coming into flower. But it was interesting when I looked at the the Larrakia seasonal calendar. Um, that calendar actually showed the season before the the, the woolly barks coming into flower as as being a great time for billy goat plum. Um, and, and I was just walking in the bush right next to my place just a few days ago. And sure enough, there were still lots and lots of billy goat plum fruit falling onto the ground. Um, and so, yeah, it made me think, well, I was expecting a, the, these other plants should be flowering by now. But from what that knowledge of the seasonal changes is, is yeah, we're, I guess we're transiting from one, one, one season to another. Um, but yeah, things are, things are sort of, Occupying a sequence or working working in in sequence, but anyway, when those um, woolly butts and stringy butts come out in flower, then there'll just be a mass of flower, a mass of mass of pollen, mass of nectar, and and that'll be really um, 
important for the for the birds and the insects. Um, and on a on a landscape scale, on a top end scale, we actually see a migration of of birds of the honey eaters. They will actually move around the landscape chasing the different resources. So so when the eucalypts are, are in flower, well then there'll be a big focus on the eucalypt woodlands. When the Melaleuca swampy country, when the Melaleucas are in flower, then there'll be a big a big movement of birds to the, that sort of wetland, wetland type type country. So on a, a sort of a, a whole top end scale, we actually have the seasonal seasonal movement of, of, of birds. Um, but also in the just bring it closer to this sort of right in Darwin around you know, near where, near near where I live. Then you know we've got the mangrove areas, we've got the coastal rainforest patches um, like at say at East Point or in Casuarina Coastal Reserve. And then there's some little patches of woodland left, and there's a few melaleuca swamps around the place. And at different times of the year, then then the birds will actually move from from one to the other and be be utilising a resource of, of one one habitat um, over over an, another. Um, habitat. And this sort of idea of habitat actually really hit me this week when we had a, a Taurus imperial pigeon in, in our garden. And I mean, to me, it's really the time when the Taurus imperial pigeons they would, would typically have flown north, they fly, they migrate each year um, and head off to islands in Southeast Asia um, and then come back next, next wet season. But what we're what we're seeing in Darwin nowadays is there'll be a minority of birds. I mean, there's certainly nowhere near as many birds around Torres and Field pigeons around as what there were a few months ago. But there'll just be a handful of birds that'll hang around for for the for the whole year. And what that's, I mean, I guess, yeah, I suppose thinking of well, to, to a Torres and Field pigeon, presumably Darwin is actually like um, like a, a big patchy rainforest with. Um, you know, a, a big good supply of fruiting trees. So I guess that that means that then the resources, the fruit resources, are actually here all year for for a, a small number of Taurus and field pigeons to, to to hang around. And that raises a couple of questions in my 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 head um, that I'd love for people to to ponder as they use their eyes, use their ears, and use their sense of smell to to get a sense of what's going on with nature. Is not only what you're experiencing, but also what's not present. So think in terms of think in terms of seasonal change, but um, yeah, okay. So oh, this is a season when I don't actually see you know, this species or that 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 species. And the other question that I like to pose to to people is um, is I guess what have we done and what we can do to provide habitat for plants and animals that, that make up this amazing natural history in the, in the top end. So I guess there's a couple of couple of questions that I'd pose to people to to think about when they're um, enjoying the, the seasonal um, changes that we, we, we see. So look, I've, I've probably sort of said enough to, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into more detailed conversations about some of the, the things that are happening later on in the, in the webinar today. But George, I think it might be um, your opportunity to, to, to say some important things about people's response, whatever. Oh, thanks, David. And um, yeah, good to see you on your balcony. I'm, I'm down here in a different season altogether, rather cool, wet Perth at the moment. And, um, and instead of looking out on, on your, your nice bird life there, I'm, well, we've got our bird life, but looking out on the ocean with the waves pretty wild at the moment and some sea lions sitting on an island just opposite. So um, I'm, I'm here because I guess I realise the value of, of nature in my life and our life. And it's... Um, been part of my lifelong research exploring how nature impacts on us and and benefits us and if we if we look at it from a, a bit of a historical perspective our our species have evolved in nature and so we've had to for our survival and for thriving we've had to adjust to adapt to and and utilize the changes of the seasons that are there for us um, to know what to gather, to what to hunt, um, as I said, for our survival. And, and, and this evolution has gone on. Some people have put it on a time clock, like a 12-hour time clock, where just the last minute or two of that time clock would have us living in highly urbanised areas. And the last second or two, really just in the high-tech lifestyles that we tend to live nowadays. And um, so nature has been important. Um, Research I discovered early in my career came not out of the clinical psychology areas where my specialty was, but really from 
uh, environmental work, environmental psychology, architecture, anthropology, areas like this that show that contact with nature benefits us physically. Um, when we get out into nature, we tend to exercise more, uh, we're engaged more in it, we physically feel better, uh, we feel psychologically better when we're making contact with nature, uh, it lifts our spirits. Um, being, being in pleasant nature environments is, is inconsistent with feeling depressed, really. Uh, you walk out, you see one of those beautiful honey eaters that you have up on the slide, and, um, and it's damn hard to feel depressed while you're looking at such beauty as that. So psychologically, we, we feel so much better for it. Um, research shows that socially people engage more with others and, and the beach area where I live, um, again, it's hard to come back from a beach walk feeling depressed because people will say, wow, what a beautiful day, you know, don't we live in paradise? So have you seen the dolphin uh, out there at the moment? Uh, and, and also there's the spiritual element that our research shows too. We, we feel spiritually more connected in nature. So it has, has multiple benefits for us um, enjoying that contact with it. So uh, we need to be looking at preserving it, protecting it, looking after it. Uh, and, and the more we grow in cities, the more we become more densely populated, the more we need nature for that. And I think there's been a, a trend with the COVID situation. I don't know if you guys have noticed it up there, but areas where I go walking around here, the car parks have been full. People trying to escape their isolation from four walls and get back into nature a bit. So, um, I mean, that's a pretty potted version of it. But, uh, uh, and it's not just being in nature, but it's also how we experience nature. I mean, we can take our bodies out there, but our heads can still be going around in the worrisome ruminative thoughts that we, we brought from home or work or wherever. And, and you mentioned, and Neville mentions in his video too, about the need to connect with our senses. You, you invited us to close our eyes and smell. And part of the research that I've done in this area has really looked at how people connect with nature, how we can use our senses for it. So it's not just being in nature, but it's being mindfully in nature too. Um, in a storm we had just a couple of days ago, I donned my waterproof, sat up on a sand dune and just experienced it. It was wild. Um, and instead of retreating into the comfort of home, but to, to feel it, it I, I felt alive in the vitality of being there and, and went through a mindfulness process myself. Let's, when we're in that position, contact with nature, what are the things we see? What are the shapes? What are the colours? What are the movements and that that are going on? Let's tune into that. What are the sounds that we're hearing? The, the, the call of the birds, the rustle of the leaves in the trees. Um, what are the smells or the aromas like the fire or the, the first rains after a long dry, dry summer um, that impinge on our nose, the smell of the soil? Are there any tactile sensations? I love just plucking a eucalypt leaf and chewing as I walk. Um, and and uh, the taste sensation, what are the tactile ones? The feel of the warmth of the sun on our skin, the cool of the breeze, the, the earth as we sit on it. Um, it's not just being in nature, but it's making that very mindful contact too. And I, I think you've brought these things up very well. So um, let's look at the seasonal changes. They're part of that experience of making that contact for us too. So yeah, I would encourage folk, um, uh, not just to enjoy the beauty that you guys are able to describe so well, but to engage in it through the senses to do that meaningfully and get out and enjoy it. Uh, we have it. Let's, let's love it and, and enjoy it. Thanks, George. That's, that's great. I yeah, agree a hundred percent. And I mean, certainly, obviously I, I get a buzz out of, out of nature. You mentioned about COVID. The, the car park, I just lived not that far from one of the recreational reserves in Darwin, Casarina Coastal Reserve. And mm. the car parks have just been packed. Um, yeah. it's, just, it's fantastic to see each night. There's just so many, so many people out enjoying, enjoying that experience of nature. So, um, yes. Yeah. If, if something's come out of it, this is one good benefit, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be some pluses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Lou, perhaps um, back, back to you to... Um, Take us on to Neville's video. Hello. I have Bulai Nakangela. 
Nó bắt đầu chờ Ây em đọc rằng À em có ạc quê Giấy mình nhìn về Vậy Mới này kìa có phải đi đặt mấy lần mê Nên mà đặt mấy lần mê Cũng mặc mặc nó mấy này Ờ bà lần đặt mấy mê bê ta season Bà lần đặt mấy mê April Kau dimana pelan dari April. Ngaji pengen lagi hari ini pun ngaji mana 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 ngaji hari ini malu. Mana hari ini belok me panggilan. Panggilan. Ngaji nan. Ngaji nan ni mana kau ini mai. Nabi ika aku pia kau ini mai. Mak arwok pekan mai kau di. Arwokan mai kau di. Wok pia kau. Wok pia. Eh hari ini nak pengen wok pia kau. But ni mana kau yolol me. Oh kau mula wan aku. Mana yang ada yang ada kun mal, obalan dalam season. Mina jual kau juga mai ni mek eh, kalau kau pelat me, oh nabi yang ada nan mai. Mak kun kau ngol ngari nan kun kau ngol. Mai ina ni man kai mengku ya, wu ni man kai mana kau mai nukar dolgan. Kalau nabi me dragonfly, at kari me jalan ngari jalan ngari. Ni mek eh ngari nan, kalau kalau lor me ni mek eh. Karun dulu beren, mana yang ngareng ngareng, kun mal, panggil yang, mai arunan, kopi ga, mai arwok pekan, kopi ga, arunan jalan ngareng jalan ngareng, kun kau ngol makan nang kau ngol piga men, kuku makan ponan, mak, man me, man me mak hari mang bol kimi kare, kani mang man me, kuno ka, mana mal kuno ngareng ngareng, panggil yang. Kan memang kaya mereka hari bulan mereka hari karu kaya awal, mungkin jet, kan bang, mungkin kau jepang, mandem, wait ni mereka mula kan ngaruh set season, kure, kan mereka ngarungun, buku kan hari bungun, makanan kan amal kita met mereka ngaruh, kuno amal kita mereka nu, wait hari buru pun, balik hari kuri ini. Ada ngade emak ni pun bolok, baru bolok nak nan. Wei, baru bolok kayak aku nak karung, bukan ada ngade. Bolok no ada ngade, aku kayak aku nak bukan ul kayak ngat, tapi bolok korup ul kayak bolok no. Ada ngade, kuning kayak, kuning kayak ni. Mana mana? Mana mana mak nak angkat perai man kai me, kujau, panggereng, urgeng, yeke, pulmeleng, kurung, kai meran. Iman angkat pini, buat mana ke? Kau boleh me. Kau boleh main arah arah. Mana mana man jauh, man man jauh kuji. Perkara arah arah macam ni. Iman ngar kari kari mepini six pattern. Oh season kat perih. Oh mak nak kat perih six. Mana ke? Kari eh kalau aku ngar pini kari buru pun mana ke? We change kai main. Kari buru pun buru that time kap. Kena mana ya kap? Mere mak nak kap mere. Baik, kari nan. En, en, en kari ini. Oh, sepeda kari ini. Ya, banyak, banyak punya banyak ke. Panggil yang banyak punya. Bukan mengkurung kari, kari kari berperan ki. Men, men biar mal no. Baik, meneke. Ya lah kari nan. Bagan mana ini, kau meke kari mana ini. Bu, polet bang meneke. Mana mal no. Itu. Kau melawar kari mana ini, kari nan man gui. Kau kau ngol kari nan. Mai kari nan. Oh, kun bol karinan, kun bol kat perih kau nak karinan. Bukarinan mana? Kamu let me? Wah, kari buru pun mana ke malu nak nak ada? Kap me? Bukai meran? Iman kai me? Bol kau me? Bangkaran kap me? Wah, ye ke kembali meran? Kalau kalau kau beke, ni lah karinan. Bagaimana mana ini? Bukan mana kaya mak, mana kaya meran. Bangkiring macam ikan, ikan kaya meran. Nalai kari nan. Mana pejengaranan? 
Man beje, man mana ini? Man beje hari hari membogen. Man beje hari hari membogen. Hari hari ini irica, endua. Mana man beje irica? Mana 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 dupa? Mana mana dupa man bega? Mana mana ka ka kari? Mana kau 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 kari? Oh kau re? Kau lapar lapar kari? Inan man beje, man bega. Maka dua. Mana kau kari inan? Man beje kau berpak pun mana irica? Kau berpak me. Doa, baik guna hari ini, ya kira ni. Bagi iman kami, bu bangga yang kami merana ini, ya kira. Kun mayor, bangga ni nan. Kun mayor, mana ke? Kau jiwi ni. Kamu kamu rabun. Kau jiwi, kau lebih kamu kamu. Kau yang bangga ni nan kamu. Baik guna kan mana iman aku. Kun mayor kamu. Kau yang bangga kamu. Kari kat bangga kamu. Kak bangga kamu. Nuwalt me, walem bangga kamu nuwalt me. Wah iman ku ni kai me bol ke me dan ke karib mana be me ye ke? Karib akan bol kun ma karib akan kun mayor kampun. Aku kau yang bekam mereka kuri kami from east. Bayi bol pun mana ke kun mayor kau? Bela bela kampun kampun ke kaki kau ye kualem ogar gat be. Ma. Okay, well now we have Ian up. Um, do do you want to share your screen, Ian? Okay. Yes, you might want to share screen. I just put this up. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Ian Morris. Uh, I live up here in the top end of the Northern Territory. Been very lucky uh, just lately to have spent quite a bit of time in the bush. Um, and uh, most of my 50 years of working life, or all of my 50 years of working life, I've spent up here in the, the top end natural environment. And luckily, uh, I've been living with uh, indigenous groups in Eastern Arnhem Land, different language group to Neville. Um, I've been with the Saltwater Gang. He's a freshwater man and the Stone Country man. Um, and I just put this image up here because uh, one of Neville's mates, uh, an old fellow called Bluey Ilkir, uh, he wanted Australia to know how his people, just like Neville did, how his people see the natural seasons. And he painted this on a big piece of uh, sandstone, which is now embedded in the floor of the Boali Centre in Kakadu for people to, to learn about the white months, of course, are our Western whitefella months. And you're able to extrapolate into those uh, six seasons that Neville was teaching us about, Gurung, Gunamaleng, and right round Gudjo, Bangadeng, Wurugeng, Yege is in there too, Yege, the cold weather season. Um, and I find Indigenous people are far more sensitive to the changes in these seasons. We just see wet and dry, us uh, white fellas, and it uh, gets a bit boring, you know. Whereas uh, if you uh, ask an Aboriginal person, uh, which way was the wind blowing yesterday, they'll tell you. If you ask any of my European mates, they'll, they'll think you're nuts. They wouldn't have a clue. I find Indigenous people are far more attuned to everything that's going on around them, the bird calls, the insect noises, the direction of the winds, the strength of the winds, and therefore, they see when these beautiful seasons start and finish. There's all sorts of indicators. And I think coming up, we've, we've, um, we've turned this into a bit of a, a Western thing now by trying to get across to non-Indigenous people how Indigenous people see the seasons around them. And uh, even in the small area like the top end of the NT, with all the different language groups, we have many different kinds of... Uh, uh, expressions of these these seasonal conditions. So saltwater people see it quite differently to the inland people and so forth and way down into the Arab zone. Um, and the languages change, so the descriptions change, but it's the same season. So very interesting to have a look at all of these. And a little later on, we will show you um, uh, where you can get in touch with these seasonal calendars and learn about the regions that you're, you're living in or visiting. Um, some of the things that have just gone on around here in the wetlands, which are very fast drying out now up here in the top end, um, because of the extreme wet and the, then the extreme dry, um, we do get a lot of plants and animals that capitalise on that. And some of them are insectivorous plants, like these ones we see around Darwin. Um, and so you've got your little uh, uh, droseras, your sundews, and uh, all sorts of other little insect, insect gathering plants that are not getting enough nutrients out of the soil, so they're, they're digesting insects uh, to supplement their diets. And they're seasonal, they all fizz out and disappear by about mid-dry season. Um, and that's very, very interesting. Uh, we're seeing a time now up here in the north where the wetlands are drying out rapidly and all the, uh, the, the 
aquatic invaders on those wetlands, particularly fish, file snakes, um, all sorts of things like that, invertebrates. Uh, they're being gobbled up now by the water birds that are cashing in on this bonanza before it dries up. Um, so uh, as Neville was saying before, there's a season called Bungarang. And, and for birds and animals, that's also the peak season. That's when every kind of food's available for them. Later on at the end of Gurung, uh, that's the last, the dry season. It's hot, it's dry, all surface water's disappeared. And these birds are looking a lot skinnier. Um, so we do see these big seasonal changes. Neville told us about uh, the insect life, the aquatic insect life that uh, is in abundance now. So if you take a drive uh, out to Kakadu from Darwin, you'll get bugs splattered all over your windscreen. Um, indicative of this season. There's a dragonfly just metamorphosing into its adult stage. And of course, that's powering nature because who's waiting for the dragonflies? Lots of things. Many, many things. I took this photo just the other day, but we see this all the time. So there's these big pulses of energy coming out that the wet season uh, produces and then sends out through the dry months. Um, here are some of our top end honey eaters, uh, the sort of birds that Dave gets on his veranda. Um, the most beautiful, in my opinion, of course, that little red headed fellow there. Um, it's mainly associated with the mangroves of the Darwin area and, and uh, west and east of here, uh, but many other kinds, beautiful birds. And so plants are pumping out nectar. So as, as again, as Dave was referring, um, there's this big energy flow that's going on and all the animals and, and, and uh, nectar feeding uh, mammals even, like sugar gliders, they're all tuned into this wonderful pulse of energy flowing through the system. That means they know when to be in the right place at the right time like that little varied lorikeet there. Um, and so, you know, the more you get tuned into nature up here, the more exciting it gets. I've been here 50 years, as I said, but I still go out there and learn something completely new every day. And my Aboriginal mates say, you should have known that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's never ending. Uh, and of course, at night time, we're the same thing in our paper barks. Um, we've got these lovely little mammals, like this little red flying fox here. Um, absolutely amazing little critters, if you had anything to do with them. And they're mainly nectar feeders. And uh, so with their wonderful noses, they, uh, they follow the flowering plants around, um, traveling, as we now know, up to about 40 k's a night from their campsites to the uh, food sources and then back again. And uh, nearly every species of animal is, uh, is doing this up here. Um, so I won't worry too much about the details there. We'll, we'll make those available a little later. Um, but little red flying foxes can be in camps up to a million individuals. That's a lot of mammals. Um, at the same time, and Neville could have gone on for days about this, but uh, at this changeover period now, when we're going from, from the production of the wet season, the drying out period through those three or four Aboriginal seasons, a lot of bush foods are available. I put this one on because I think I ate all of those that are on the screen. Um, and they're called bush currants and full of vitamin C. And there's absolutely loads of them this year. Uh, out there in the, the woodlands. And uh, there are many other kinds as well. So the most important thing um, in this whole system is, is the transfer of food and energy uh, in nature. And it's going on in, in vast amounts. What we're looking at there is the drying out of the sorghum um, that Dave was talking about, that Neville was talking about, and the seeds uh, dry out and drop. And then we've got all these little birds like uh, chestnut-breasted mannequins and partridge pigeons, there's, there's heaps of them. And they're all after this product here, which is um, not very appetizing looking to us humans, is it? Um, and if you get that stuck in your underwear, it's, uh, it's pretty awkward stuff. Uh, it's all one way. It, it's uh, spear grass seeds are set up almost as a weapon. Uh, but the whole idea is for it to bury itself in the ground uh, using the overnight uh, humidity and the, the dry part of the middle of the day to push with the shaft of the seed, push the, the seed way down into the soil up to about 10 centimetres and then it's immune from fire that comes later in the dry season because the whole rest of the crop, the rest of the plant is fuel. So sorghum's little trick is to provide a lot of fuel, get rid of its competition, the other species of grasses and have its seed safely tucked out of the way so when the wet season arrives they all germinate and you've got a big crop of sorghum. Now, um, these, this is a closer look at some of the little birds that cash in on all these different seeds, grass seeds, and uh, the pigeons, the finches, the quails, uh, the parrots, they all nest when all this big seed uh, is available. Here's a little corella, we see this every day around here. Uh, the birds fly with their, their feet stretched out straight into the sorghum. And, let, and grip and, and they bend it down and then they can get access to the spear grass seeds. And that's what he's doing there. He's just chomping the, uh, 
the, the seeds up as fast as you can possibly go. I took this photo out of a car at Fog Dam. If you ever get that chance to go out along Fog Dam, you'll see these lovely little bright red birds called crimson finches, and they're chomping away on the various types of seed that's, that's out there. So are the, uh, right at this particular time now, the masked finches, which we don't know a lot about, they're kind of, uh, well, they hide. Uh, they don't hang around humans a lot, but they're very beautiful birds, seed eaters. At this time of the year now, they're building their nests, and this, their little nests, believe it or not, are made out of dead grass. So um, they don't really want people burning off too early around their breeding areas. They've got to get that all done first in the dead grass. Um, and of course, indigenous people know this. They know that the partridge pigeons are nesting, that the marsh finches are nesting at ground level in dead material. So you've got to be careful when, you, when and where you light your fires, but they are very uh, environmental uh, environment managers, the Aboriginal people, and that's why Australia was in such good ecological order when Europeans first arrived. Not quite so anymore. This is up in the stone country where Neville lives. Um, this is sandstone, and of course that seeding grass is spinifex, one of the many types of spinifex, and it lets go a huge volume of seed up there which feed things like the white quilled rock pigeon, uh, and in Arnhem Land it's actually the chestnut quilled rock pigeon. Um, and this inspires them to breed and raise their chicks on the abundance of seed. Um, likewise, here's another little bird that grabbed a bit of uh, vertical grass and landed on it and bent it right down to ground level. And now he's going to show us what they do. Um, they pull the seeds out. This is, of course, the Goulian finch, um, one of our most treasured little jewels of a bird. And right now, just south of Darwin, they're breeding in the hollow limbs of some of our, uh, uh, what we call hill salmon gums, which is their favourite tree. So they nest in the hollows of these salmon gums. They only do it when there's an abundance of seed so that the male can feed the wife who's doing all the housework. She's incubating the eggs and stuff. And then when the chicks hatch, they need a lot of, uh, a lot of food to, to um, get them right through to adulthood. This is uh, a bit of an unnatural scene. I've put down there abnormal. Um, this is native sorghum or spear grass. And it's in way uh, too dense a crop here. And that's as a result of poor burning in the last uh, 100 years or so. And as I said earlier, speargrass loves fire. The hotter the fire, the more speargrass you get next year. The, the, uh, the cooler the fire um, and the timing of the fire can regulate the amount of speargrass you get. So my uh, indigenous friends look at this around Darwin and they say, oh boy, somebody doesn't know what they're doing with the matchbox here. And uh, so traditionally, this, this crop of Sorghum, which is a native plant, would have been managed much more carefully with cool burns and patchwork burns. And quite often, if there's too much sorghum, which means fuel load for the dry season, they'll do little wet season patch burns and take the plants out before they mature. So they break the seed cycle. This is what we call an obligate seeder. And once the cycle's broken, um, can't produce seed that year, uh, it takes another uh, five or 10 years to, uh, to recolonize the area. So you can actually manage the percentage of sorghum that's around. Now, up here in the top end, there's two big factors at play. One is, is uh, fire and the other one is termites. So what you're looking at there is a bunch of, uh, it's the side of a big mound of termites and out, out of that mound are coming what we call allates, winged reproductive uh, termites that are coming out in their hundreds of thousands on a warm, uh, post wet season night um, and then their job is to fly off, pair up, mate and start a new colony. But they are actually feeding the ecosystem enormous amounts of energy in doing that because each individual reproductive termite or uh, allate is over 70% protein. So guess who's eating them? Everybody. Birds, reptiles, mammals are all catching and eating termites and they get a big dose of protein. Uh, you only need two little termites from a mound to actually reproduce the colony. This is on my wall uh, just outside Darwin on, uh, on a particular night when the termites are flying. You can see them all gathering on the wall there. Um, way too many to start, just simply start another colony. They're feeding everybody and putting a whole lot of protein into the ecosystem. Where are they getting the protein? They're eating sorghum. They're eating the dead grass, all our annual grasses that, that germinate and proliferate and then flower and seed and drop their seed all before the wet finishes and then they die. And the next crop relies entirely on that seed. These guys are cutting it all up into little lengths and they're giving it to everybody else. Now, what you can see here is a little uh, Carlia skink. There's lots of those around my place. 
and uh, they're representative of all our little vertebrate animals. They're munching up these flying termites. Every time it happens, they hop into it. The wood swallows, the fryer birds, um, everything's knowing this is coming. The, the frill necked lizards, as you can see on the right hand side there, they're, they're hoovering in these, these, uh, this vast amount of protein in a short time. Frill necked lizards, next week, the males are all coloured up with beautiful red throats and black bellies, and they're showing off to each other. And only days later, the female frill necks are laying their eggs powered by termites and protein. It's amazing the cycle that's going on. Um, we have many kinds of termites. These are the big in your face ones we call cathedral termites. And all the green around there is the food for the dry season, which is gonna be chopped up and taken into their little factories, the orange bits. And they are like powerhouses. And in those factories, they're converting lignin, they're converting dead wood and grass and whatever um, into protein. Now, nothing, no other life forms are doing it. And uh, an old CSIRO researcher told me after studying this all his life, he said, these, these termites are recycling tons per acre per annum. That's a lot of grass. And they're giving it back to nature and keeping a little bit for themselves. If you get rid of your termites, um, you're shutting down a whole industry, a massive industry. If you Google termites, you know what you get? About 36 pest control companies tell you how bad termites are. In actual fact, our tropical ecosystems would collapse if it wasn't for those little guys in those mounds. It's amazing. So I call them energy factories. Um, at the end of the dry season, this is down towards the, uh, the uh, Catherine Mataranka area. At the end of the dry season, you can see how each of those little colonies there has removed the grass around it and processed it. And it's all waiting now inside for the right uh, uh, humidity levels. And then they release their allates and the whole cycle starts again. It's quite amazing. So here's, um, here's some of those little guys, and that's dead sorghum, dead spear grass you can see there at the end of the, the uh, wet season. And there's uh, the pointy nose ones are the uh, soldiers, the guards, and the uh, round nose ones are the workers who are chopping up that sorghum into little bits and taking it into those mounds for processing. Um, they use special gut fauna to uh, help them do that. Um, interesting, interesting thing. So what we've actually got here in the top end um, that we see playing out around us every year, wet to dry, is a tuss tussle between fire and termites. Now, modern man doesn't know anything about termites and we don't care about them. We think they're horrible little things that shouldn't be there. And our fire removes their food. And so that, that causes problems. So this is a little area just outside Darwin. I noticed one year, none of the termites in that area had anything to eat but we're told that they have up to three years storage in their mounds so that if they do have a bad year and some person lights a fire uh, at the wrong time and robs them of their livelihoods, they can still keep processing on last year's products and it can, it can go for up to two or three years. But if we keep burning like that at bad fires, the colony dies. And we've actually wiped out huge area of termites in the top end of the territory, unfortunately. Um, a lot of our fires these days look like this. Um, and as you can see, live trees crash to the ground. The canopy is scorched so that it loses all its leaves. Uh, what the tree ecologists are finding out is if you have a bad fire like this, the eucalypts in this forest, the woolly butts in this case, the dominant eucalypts, don't flower for about three years. So energy flow, nectar production, all that stops uh, because some person lit a fire at the wrong time. Even the wrong time of day can cause this. Uh, indigenous people had the secrets for all this. We've almost lost it now, thinking that, you know, in, with our cultural arrogance, uh, hmm, we go for hazard reduction, we go for asset protection, all these things, not very ecological, but anyway, here's a little diagram um, that has been put out on the net to just show us in Australian terms how much fire occurs. And this is in the period between 1997 and 2002. So a lot of those bright orange areas were burnt up to four times with fairly hot fires um, each, each year. So it... It can, be, it can be awkward. Here's something that one of, uh, one of our associates here, John Wynarski, um, he's now Professor John Wynarski, he wrote this little paragraph I thought was very profound. The conservation challenge in Northern Australia is to achieve some balance in fire regimes, such that not enough of the landscape is frequently burnt to provide benefit for species such as the bandicoot, and John was a mammologist, he loved his native mammals, and enough of the landscape is infrequently burnt to provide benefit to species such as the possum. At present, that balance does not exist. In the eucalypt savannah, there are few areas that escape fire for more than five years. The possums and their teammates 
are losing out. And uh, I'm afraid he's dead right. However, um, Neville's gang, we're on the money. And we're getting back to this now. Uh, indigenous burning regimes produced um, a reduction in the fuel so that a hot dry season fire couldn't cause damage later in the year. So they do these gentle little burns. There's Violet just lighting a fire there out in Kakadu. Um, the right day of the year, they say if you do it on the right day of the year, you actually benefit plants and animals. If you're too early, you don't achieve the, the benefits of fire. If you're too late, you do damage. And if you're really late, like that bad set fire I showed you, you can put the ecosystem backwards about 10 years. So these people really knew what they were doing. Amazing. So um, we've got little groups now who are doing this, burning back to the traditional regimes. And uh, here's an example of a good fire. Just have a look at the intensity of this fire. What this is doing is actually getting rid of the dead annual grasses and, and shed leaves and, and whatnot of the wet season, but it's not even killing the seedlings that uh, baby eucalypts and other, other small trees, um, they're all surviving, no problems at all. So uh, I won't dwell on this, but um, if you lit a fire in this environment uh, during the middle of the day, a few weeks later, you could have an intense fire that burnt the canopy of the forest. So there's the difference, I'll move along here. Now, when a fire goes through our ecosystems up here, through the sorghum areas, um, straight away, if it's a cool fire like this one, this is a little, little what we call a mosaic burn, a gentle burn. Um, there's a Goulian finch down there getting toasted moosely, I assume. Um, they're interested in the seeds that they can now get access to, which have fallen through to the ground, uh, are, but are, are still available. The fire wasn't a high enough intensity to burn the seeds, so they have another bonanza. So again, Aboriginal people were in sympathy with the ecosystem that was around them. Now, um, Neville talked about Dua and Yiricha speargrass. This is the Dua speargrass. This is annual sorghum. Um, and this is less than a week after a cool fire. So you can see if the fire's low intensity, it allows perennial plants, the permanent ones, to keep growing and producing salads for agile wallabies and things like that. Some of John Wanaski's mates will be grazing on these things. And this is what a good fire can look like. The fire's been through this area. Now, I was just in this area the other day. I've been watching this one for years. And uh, the fire's gone through. And you can see there's enough moisture in the soil to produce another green layer for all the herbivores, the uh, antilopine kangaroos, the agile wallabies, the nail tail wallabies. They all live in this habitat. So you see, if people are in sympathy with these seasons, they know when to burn and how to burn. And everybody's happy. OK, now, I, I mentioned earlier, I grew up with the saltwater people. And you see on the left-hand side, there's a little red flower in that photograph. That's one of our currajongs, a brachychiton. Um, and when that little currajong comes out, they call it, where I come from, it's called darangluk. When uh, the men see darangluk, or the women actually, when the women see darangluk, they say to their husbands, right, the stingrays and the small sharks have got fat in their livers, go and get us some, send the husbands out. And uh, this is what uh, my mate Lirua here is doing. And he's, they don't hunt this species any other time of the year except when they know their livers are enlarged. And guess what? Menzies School of Health recently discovered that when the liver's enlarged, they're full of omega-3 oil. And how good is that for your body, omega-3 oil? So these people would, would only exploit the uh, small sharks, the reef sharks, and the, and the certain types of stingrays when their livers were enlarged um, as a food, a really good health food. So knowing your seasons actually contributed to the quality of life you have as an Indigenous person. We should all be learning this. Um, it's really good knowledge. It keeps our environment intact, keeps us happy because we're out in the environment, and uh, yeah, it, it benefits all sides. Okay, so um, this is our top end woodland. About 70% of the top end of the Northern Territory looks like this uh, when it's in good condition. Um, get out there and enjoy it. So we could talk about this for months till your ears fall off, but um, it's, it's a great place and there's so much to be seen. Just go for a walk. And as George said, let your feelings take over. Uh, I worked for many years on top of Ubera Rukout at East Alligator in Kakadu National Park. And all these city people would come up for sunset and they'd go, wow, it's doing something for our souls, for our insides. I've never felt this before. I did the same thing at Ayers Rock in 1985 for a year. I was on top of the rock every, every night with the tourists, making sure they did all the right things. Same thing, people would be overawed. They couldn't explain it, but something was happening to them just experiencing this atmosphere. So I can recommend it. Thank you.
Thank, thanks, Ian. Ian, can I just throw, I noticed in the um, questions that have come up in chat, there's um, been a bit about wind, and I guess there's two, there's two, two aspects of wind that have been raised. One is what are the, the, the big seasonal changes we see in, in wind around Darwin? And, and I guess you know, my perception living on the coast is that, well, in the you know, cool, dry times, we tend to have southeasterlies, which are bringing cool air. And in the, in the sort of hot, moist times, and we tend to have, have north, northwesterlies. What's your sense of, of the, se the seasonal patterns? I mean, that's a very simplistic view. Of, of winds. I mean, obviously we get seasonal storms and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. What do you see? What do you see happening in the in the top end in terms of those big wind patterns? Well, I, I had my senses tuned for me when I was quite young by uh, indigenous people from Arnhem Land, the Yulama mob, and they they have actually produced a, a seasonal calendar on winds, and uh, it's very very specific. And I know as a science teacher, I'd be sitting in front of my class doing something very very important. And all the kids will be looking out the window and going, oh, wow, the wind's changing. Now, that never happens with non-Indigenous classes, but it sure happens with those. They're aware of these changes. And every wind has a name. It's, it's from a certain direction. So Bulunu, uh, Jalatang, uh, Lugurma, Bara. Bara is the northwest monsoon. Every wind has got a, uh, a name, and it comes at a certain time in the year, and it indicates a change. So there's also a big calendar for winds. So it, very, very important. And, of course... Another thing we're not taught in our Western society is that the barter, when it comes, it comes from the Himalayas to Northern Territory. Um, what an amazing system. And with it, it used to bring the Macassan sailors who would come here to harvest uh, uh, tree pang with the uh, coastal Aboriginal people. And then that was part, that was the first part of a huge trade that went between Australia and China before Governor Phillips set up Sydney Cove. So that was an industry that was well and truly going because of those winds, Dave. So again, it's a huge subject. Yeah. Okay. And and one of the I guess one one of the questions that's come up is actually knock them down winds. What are what are knock them down winds? Ah. Um, you wanna, well, that's uh, again um, at the end of the bara, the monsoon wind when it comes from the northwest, it retracts eventually at the end of the wet season. We might have two or three monsoon events in a good year. We didn't have very many this year. And uh, when it retracts, we get a, a, a sort of a restart of the easterly flow. And there's, there's an Aboriginal word for that. Um, and we do get the last few storms of the, because there's still a lot of humidity in the atmosphere. So we get cumulus clouds coming at us again, like the start of the wet season. At the end of the wet season, it, it restarts. And with it comes what they call the knock them down storms. And there's all the spear grass just finishing dropping its seed, standing two to three metres tall. In come these late season storms and flatten it. So that's why the knock them down name is applied to those winds or those storm systems. Okay, so, yeah, okay, so they are um, very much associated with, with, with storm cells then? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, great. Um, I noticed that um, Anna's posted a, a comment saying that um, she saw some Dali, Darwin woolly butts in flower yesterday, which, which is great. I've, I've been hanging out to see them out of, off my balcony and yet to see any this year, but um, that's fantastic. And the woolly butts just, they've just got this brilliant orange flower and they, you know, they really, really stand out to me. One of our great trees around Darwin. Woolly butts are amazing. They, they're not always on time. They, as Neville suggested, there's variation from year to year in when each season sort of peters out and the next one kicks in. Um, and I noticed woolly butts and stringy barks can vary uh, by a month and a half sometimes in when they start flowering. And uh, so we haven't really seen a big, uh, a big burst of flower from either the woolly butts or the stringy barks this year yet, but it's coming, I understand. Um, well, thank you everyone for tuning in today. And um, I guess uh, there are lots of things that you can do in the NT um, to find more information and get more involved in what we've talked about today. And we've put up some suggestions on this slide here, including uh, Bird Life Australia, the Top End Native Plant Society, uh, Field Naturalist Club. Um, all of those little groups have 
most of them have Facebook pages, I think, but they all have websites as well. So definitely check those out to um, learn more about the top end seasons. Um, and you can get involved in some Indigenous tours and we've put up some links as well to some of those. We have some books as well. Some books here include um, this Kakadu National Park book, Native Plants. Um, the Environment Centre NT also have a Wildlife in the Top End book that you can buy from our website or um, in our store um, at our offices. And then there's the Indigenous calendar there from the CSIRO and um, the government there. Um, I could probably... Uh... Ian, yeah. Yeah, well, Greg, of course, as, as was mentioned at the beginning, um, was a ranger in Kakadu long before it was called Kakadu, actually, um, back, way back into the mid-70s. And uh, he was involved with the Indigenous uh, owners and, and others in, uh, in fire management. And over the many years that he's, he's not long retired, actually, and over those many years, he made lots of observations. And this book is based mainly on that and uh, includes lots and lots of gems for for people managing the uh, the tropical savannas of Australia. So it's it's a good read, lots of anecdotal material in it as well. I haven't read it yet, mind you. I, I, I've known him all my life and I've heard all the stories out of his mouth, but it's going to be an interesting read, I'd say, and it's uh, going to be available, I think, in a few months' time. Great, thank you. Um, and another thing, um, all this talk today about the bush foods, another Facebook group and website that um, has full of resources about where you can find different bush foods and when they are in season is Emma Lupin um, runs Taste of the Top End and um, Gulp and Tea. And you can go to both those websites or Facebook pages and there's recipes, um, foraging tips and lots of information and photos about what you can find and um, when you're likely to find it as well. And you can also link in through that. She does sometimes with um, different Indigenous groups, um, walking tours around different parts of Darwin where um, you're taught how to forage for these foods as well. Um, so we have a little slide here about ECNT's Territory Guardian Program. Um, this is our monthly donor program and you can become a Territory Guardian for as little as $1 per month. Um, you can always donate more than that, but that is the minimum. So um, becoming a Territory Guardian, guardian helps keep the Environment Centre um, independent and make sure that we're able to offer things like what we've done today, but also doing things on a policy and advocacy level to make sure our environment is protected and um, that action is being taken against climate change and that really positive things are being um, yeah, legislated in the NT to protect our environment. So there's information on this on our website and the link's just there. I'm going to now advertise our upcoming one um, on gamba grass. Will it change the top end forever? And that one is happening um, later in June. So this will be on our website over the next week um, where you can begin to register. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.